What is happening out there, Roto Scouts baseball fans? Welcome to the Midweek Wednesday Show. Happy Hump Day, everybody. Good to see everybody already here hanging out in the chat. Saw a little quorum already. Cujo Blues here, Stephen B, Travis Windham. Got our Cathelza and Andy Melman already here. Spencer the King is already here. Excellent to see everybody when I had a pop-up show at 4.15, odd start time. Kind of just lost track of the afternoon. I was writing about the slate and just took my time getting through the seven games. And uh, lo and behold, it was later than I thought it would be. So uh, we're starting a little late. We're up against the 6.40 lock time. So we're going to try and talk a little bit fast. Tizzleman's here. Fanatic's here. Larry's here. I'm not, I didn't miss you guys. You hadn't said anything yet. I missed you. I mean, I missed you like, you know, since yesterday, obviously. We've got an interesting slate. We've got a couple potential weather spots. Might be an interesting uh, place to start the show. Let me pull up. Uh, our buddy Mr. Roth is where we always go from over at Roto Grinders. We don't give away his for pay stuff, but we definitely take a look at his free report. The one I was really concerned about is the Mets and Atlanta game. I flagged these in the article. Um, Roth seems to think that this one's going to go postponed, the Mets and Atlanta, um, which is, let me I'll tell you what, let me put it up this way so that you guys have something other than my ugly mug as I'm like leaning in to, to read these things. We can do that and then we can go like this and we'll combine this with talking about the, uh, the run board. So, uh, this one's a bit dicey for weather. Roth is, uh, kind of calling that like that. We've also got a little bit of weather in the Cincinnati game. He was, I guess, originally thinking more uh, postponed. Now it's kind of a wait and see, but pretty ugly weather in the area. The Marlins at Yankees game is on. That one was uh, was this one, which if we lose that one, that kind of sucks. We've got Hunter Green going in that one, one of the premium pitchers on board. Interesting spots for bats always in that stadium, but just kind of an interesting game. Um, we're going to talk about all of these anyway, but that one's kind of in like uh, risky territory right now. Then um, this one is on the board, but as somebody who is uh, just a handful of miles away from Yankee Stadium, like it seems like we're okay. There's a, it's like a rainy, overcasty kind of day, uh, and there's more coming apparently, but it seems like we're going to be all right. Ross seems to be, uh, be leaning that way as well. And again, always default to the professional weathermen. I'm just here speculating based on what those guys are saying. Cubbies and the pods are in San Diego. That one's a day game afternoon, uh, 340 start out there. No, <laughs> no threat of weather in uh, San Diego. The Houston and Kansas City game seems all right, but potentially there's a delay mixed in there is Ross' take on it. Um, but just, you know, weather one of those weather-in-the-area midwestern -y kind of games. And then, what's the other one? Houston, KC, Oakland, Texas, uh, no, not going to be a problem. So it's really the Mets and the Braves that's the real, real concerning one. And then maybe something pops up here. If we get a delay in that one and then they resume the game, but it's been like an hour and we lose Hunter Green, that's kind of the risk to Hunter Green, I think, on this slate. But uh, he obviously projects out very well, one of the top overall pitchers on the day. So overall, forgetting about the weather concerns for now, Milwaukee at Cincinnati, eight and a half run total there. Cincinnati, decent favorites, not huge. Milwaukee... Not a bad lineup, and uh, they've got Jackson Churio in the leadoff spot in the confirmed version of the lineup, which I love. Uh, but Hunter Green, premium pitcher, a lot of strikeout potential. 4.55 implied total for the Reds at home, 4.05 for the Brewers on the road. You can see in that ballpark, 8.5 run total, um, You know, not the highest we're going to see, certainly in that park all season. So maybe not a killer, killer spot for offense just based on the ballpark, and we'll talk about Wade Miley in a minute, uh, the Brewers starter. But uh, maybe the pitching keeps it down a little bit in that one. Cubbies at the Padres. Again, this one's a 340 start time out west. So it's, you know, just keep that in mind. It's a day game, not a night game. Minor impact to runs. Eight run total there. Uh, Padres strongly favored with a 4.45 implied total. Dylan Cease on the mound, our top overall projected pitcher. But we've talked about it already. Really like that Cubs lineup. So 
I do want Cease. I do uh, plan to have a fair share of them. Um, but I don't think it's entirely safe. And you get the bad version of Dylan Cease every now and again. So I would at least at worst consider some Cub stacks to hedge a Cease position. I just really like that lineup this year. A lot of on base. It's in the article. We've talked about it on shows. Marlins at the Yankees. Yankees leading the stack tools, uh, the power index, the home run model, et cetera, et cetera. Ryan Weathers uh, starting in Yankee Stadium against that uh, right-handed Thunder and Juan Soto and so on and so forth. Uh, big spot for the Yanks, possibly, potentially, should be a big spot for the Yanks. 5.12 implied total for them. Marcus Stroman, the most expensive pitcher on the FanDuel slate, oddly. Going up against the Marlins is a very good spot for him. He's got him checked down to a 3.49 implied total in Yankee Stadium. Um, it's just weird to have him at that price point. The Orioles, so far, I believe up till the, up till showtime and probably up through lock, no Jackson Holiday for the Orioles on FanDuel. Dead minimum price on DraftKings. Lucky you guys. FanDuel will find out about it sometime on Friday. But the Orioles at the Red Sox. Um, Cole Irvin, the Orioles starter, getting a little bit of buzz. You know, as a lefty going up against the uh, the Red Sox here. But I don't really see it. I'm kind of on the Red Sox side of this one. Sox are favorite at home against a uh, pretty good Orioles team. They've got Cutter Crawford on the mound for Boston. Kind of a middle-of-the-road starter. Both teams are pulling playable totals. 4.46 for the Orioles. 4.63 for the Red Sox. I like offenses on both sides. I don't know how much Cutter Crawford I get to at like a mid-range price. I think he's decent, reasonable strikeout rate. Um, but that Orioles lineup is, is potentially pretty killer and getting better. Um, but I don't really buy the Irvin thing. And we'll, we'll look at the Red Sox numbers against lefties in a sec. Mets and the Braves extremely threatened by weather. Seems like it might not go. Devin Scott saying Atlanta seems horrible. Either five-man stacking Atlanta in one lineup or just entirely avoiding it myself. Yeah, it's not a bad take. Um, it's just, you know, I, I try and ride that out until I actually know what's going to happen with the game or, like, you know, we get closer to lock uh, weather conditions and, and reporting. I hate when I've got to actually play weather, man. At the very least, though, on FanDuel, I haven't tested it this year, actually. Um, but on FanDuel last year, and I think the year before maybe, they were allowing you, even if the game time had passed already, they moved the games back on their schedule when they're uh, delayed but not yet postponed. And if it gets PPD, you can still swap out of those positions. Don't ride with that. Let's test it first. I haven't checked it yet this year. But that's what FanDuel was allowing you to do, um, I think, the last two years. So you gain a little advantage with that situation on FanDuel where you can kind of ride it anyway. And then if it goes PPD, you just swap out of it and get to... The Astros are a pretty comparable team and a direct swap like positionally and salary wise for uh, for who you'd be playing from the Braves. So there's room to do that. Um, I guess I don't know what time that game starts as compared to what time the uh, that's a 740 start compared to a 720 start with the last game of the day is 805. So, yeah, maybe there's not that much room to do that today, because if that one delays at 720, you're not going to have games to swap into unless it's delayed and then PPD 20 minutes later. So. Yeah, a little dicey there. You've got a 40-minute runtime from the lock from lock up until uh, when that game's scheduled to start. So a little bit dicier than on a full slate with 10 p.m. games to do that. Um, but I think it is at least a little bit there, considering you've got Houston and, and Texas, for that matter, after them. Um, if that game happens to play... <laughs> Uh, I think the Mets are in a pretty interesting spot again. Um, they're just really cheap for their talent upside. They didn't quite get there yesterday. Scored a few runs late. Pete Alonso hit a, uh, a home run, but the, the overall stack failed yesterday. They were in my lineup. Um, didn't like that, and I had all the wrong Dodgers in with it. Had uh, Carlos Rodon, who we got right, but uh, Tyler Glasnow blew away the slate yesterday. So you needed Glasnow, Shea Langoliers, and then whatever after that. Um, but didn't quite get there with the Mets yesterday, but if this game happens to play, I think they're in a reasonable spot. 4.28 implied total. Braves with the highest total on the board against Jose Quintana, uh, 5.33 implied total for Atlanta. They're just going to be at or near the top of the board all season long. Houston against KC. Um, Houston rolling out a um, a prospect rookie for his debut start, and he was kind of shaky in the minors last year. Kind of like the looks of KC in this spot. 4.66 implied total for Kansas City. They're slight underdogs here, but a 9.5 run total in that game. And you can always take the Astros on the other side of that, going up against Seth Lugo in this spot. Seems like a pretty prime spot for the Astros at a 4.94 implied total. 
the lowly Oakland A's, who have been admittedly a little bit frisky um, in spots and have ruined a couple spots where we're targeting them. They're going up against Cody Bradford today. Bradford's another guy drawing a little bit of popularity. Not a full believer based on what I saw last year, but seems like maybe he's taken some strides. It's very, very early, very small sample to say that that's the case, um, but a great matchup spot for him at, at the very least. And then Texas uh, going up against Oakland is pretty heavy favorites with a five, five plus implied team total. Looks like a pretty great spot for them. Uh, that's the Cubs lineup coming in. We've got most of the lineups in already. So we're going to hopefully be able to breeze through some of this. Uh, let me pull up the article. Tizzlemane's running in Sox Yank Stacks. I like the uh, I like the Sox side, and obviously I think the Yankees are the uh, the top play on the entire slate. I think they're going to be popular. It's, it's kind of an obvious spot, um, but I don't think it really matters, and I don't think the Red Sox are going to be all that popular, especially if people are actually going to Cole Irvin against them. So I think that's a pretty good stack combo. Uh, I went with the Sox, a more expensive pitcher, and uh, one of the teams I mentioned liking uh, in my placeholder lineup. But uh, I'll certainly have some Red Sox-Yankees combos in there, I, I would have to think. Uh, all right, so let me pull up the article on the site real quick so I can refer to it from time to time. Full breakdown up on the website. Took a little while to get through. Uh, so starting off here, medium risk of weather in Cincinnati. Somebody in the chat was saying I don't think uh, Cincinnati plays. Devin also doesn't buy it with Irvin, especially in Fenway. Yeah, I'm with you. Irvin hasn't been fantastic against lefties either, so it's not like Casas and Devers are horrible plays. I'll die with some Boston hitters tonight. Yeah, and Devers is a good hitter, a good lefty against lefties. Had good numbers last year, effective numbers to start this season, despite not starting the season on a great foot. And kind of the same thing with Casas. Um, so I'm really not worried about those guys. Jaron Duran has been good against lefties, so I'm not really worried about him. So I think it's just totally overblown. I really don't think it's like that great a spot for a fairly weak lefty. So we'll get there. Somebody in there was saying, um, Fanatic was saying, uh, I don't think Cincinnati plays. So um, Fanatic, any specific insight that's making you think that or um, just speculating, like, do you live in Cincinnati, know the area and uh, and how the weather is? Not sure how, not sure where that's coming from, just or whether you're just thinking it. R radar? Okay. Radar looks worse for the Reds than for the Braves. Yeah, I, I didn't actually pull up radar. I might get to that later on and uh, take a peek. But, um, you know, like I said, I, j I just like kind of riding with the professionals. Let the weathermen do the weather forecasting. I'll do the baseball forecasting. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely a dicey spot. Um, what I was saying, though, it, it's kind of interesting that the run total is not crazy high in this one. You've got Hunter Green, who's very, very good, 28.3% strikeout rate in his first two starts of this season and was very effective. That's not the right one. That's the NBA projections. NBA projections will be up, uh, hopefully, after the show if I still have enough time. Um, Hunter Green last year, 30.5% strikeout rate over 112 innings, 22 starts. Walked a few too many at 9.6. Definitely had a bit of an ugly whip. Got blown up in a couple spots and pitches in a band box of a ballpark in his home starts. 4.82 ERA and a 4.01 XFIP. A little bit too much premium contact. A little bit too many home runs. But the swinging strikes are excellent. They were excellent the year before. Similar numbers the year before. 30.9% strikeouts, 125 and two-thirds over 24 starts. 14.5% swinging strikes. He's an excellent starter for strikeout upside. He's a very effective DFS starter most of the time. He's going up against a kind of middle-of-the-road Brewers lineup. I love Churio in the leadoff spot. Their premium rookie, one of the top rookies in uh, in all of baseball, or top prospects anyway. He's gotten out to a very strong start. Moving, He's moved up and down a couple times in the lineup, but uh, love him in the leadoff spot. He's got speed. He's got good power. He's getting on base at a 316 clip, but slashing 278, 316, 472. 194 ISO. He's got a pair of home runs, a stolen base, creating runs 14% better than average to start his career. Not a bad stretch of WRC plus for the top end of this Brewers lineup. So there's some hitters I like in here, but I like the upside for Hunter Green. You just need this game to go clean because if he goes... You know, let's say they delay in like the fourth inning and it's an hour-long delay. We might have five, six strikeouts on deck by then, but we we aren't getting our bonuses. He's probably not coming back out after a long delay. So that's the risk you run rostering Hunter Green now. It's a very high price at 9700 In a clean game, he's totally worth it in this spot. I would pay that price for him. 9300 on DraftKings I think is probably a little cheap. It's just a little bit threatened by weather, not an ideal ballpark, and a decent, not great team on the other side. 
William Contreras, very good catcher option, 4,800 uh, on DraftKings where you need catchers, 34 on FanDuel is a fair price. He's got a 10.38. He's over the magic number for uh, home run upside today. That's a little bit of ballpark effect in, coming into play there, but it's also a little bit of the premium contact that Hunter Green has allowed. Christian Yelich has four home runs already on the season, two stolen bases. Rumors of his demise are very exaggerated over the last few years. We talk about it all the time on this show, but uh, premium contact galore still from Christian Yelich. Maybe he doesn't ever go back to the 30-plus, 40-plus home run guy that he was once uh, and the MVP candidate that he was. This is a killer season. 19 homers, 28 steals, greater runs 22% better than average, got on base at a 370 clip, 278, 370, 447. It's a great year, especially for, for what we're looking for. It's a killer season, and he's got more than that based on the hard hit. If he manages to continue elevating the ball just a little bit more, we could go back to 30 home runs. He's out to a great start for power, 324, 410, 706, 382 ISO. Love some Christian Yelich. Only striking out 17.5% of the time. Not a bad strikeout option. Willie Adames strikes out uh, aggressively historically. Only at 15.6% over his 45 plate appearances so far. Uh, I'll I'll give it another 100 or so plate appearances before I decide that Willie Adames has suddenly made a uh, mid-career change as far as his strikeouts go. But two home runs on, the, on board already. Uh, stolen base, a 115 WRC plus from him. South Freelick. No homers, but he's slashing 324, 410, 353 over 39 plate appearances. Creating runs 20% better than average. Doesn't hit for very much power at all. You can see it in the premium contact from last year. 2.6% barrels, 23.6% hard hits. But if he gets on base from the left side with a little bit of speed ahead of Jake Bowers, maybe some Blake Perkins at the dead min on FanDuel and 3,100 on DraftKings. Joey Ortiz, Bryce Turang from the bottom of the lineup. Turang's out to a great start. 353, 395, 559, a 155 WRC plus for him. Seven stolen bases already. He was a buzzy prospect. Came up, plays good defense, and now the bat and the uh, speed are coming around a little bit. Not a bad option at the bottom of the lineup. Makes for a reasonable wraparound playback to Churio, Contreras, Yelich, and Adamas. Joey Ortiz, a reasonable bat for cheap pricing. 313, 450, 375 over his 20 plate appearances so far. So it's not a bad Brewers lineup top to bottom if this game plays. I prefer the green side, but I would probably hedge with a little bit of Brewers, especially considering the ballpark, considering the premium contact he's allowed. The interesting side of it, I think, for the run total is Wade Miley. Wade Miley really doesn't allow a lot of power. He doesn't strike anybody out. He pitches to average to below average run numbers, 314 ERA, 485 XFIP underneath it. 316 ERA, but a 442 XFIP underneath it. Only 17.6% strikeouts. This was a small sample. 16.1% strikeouts in a larger sample. But just 31.1% hard hits. Not too many barrels. Not too bad a launch angle. Just 87 miles an hour of exit velo. Same thing in the small sample that year. We can go back in time for Miley and see some more of it if we want to. Oh, we only had pitcher stats through 2021. That's right. Or... We only have the premium contact stuff anyway. Uh, 163 innings this year, just a 2.46% home run rate, 34% hard hits, 85 miles an hour of exit velo. So it's not like I'm saying go out and play Wade Miley, but what I am saying is maybe if this game plays, he has a bit of a limiting effect on the total upside for Cincinnati. So it's not a killer Cincinnati spot. I think they have very good options. I will play some of them. But I wouldn't get over the top, I don't think, on, on Cincinnati. Miley's more likely to give up a few runs, but not a ton of power. Not get blown up, but not have a reasonable, reasonably playable DFS start. He projects out okay, but not for 7,700 with no strikeout upside, 7,200 on, uh, on DraftKings. I really don't like that option in this ballpark, especially with the weather in, in play. India is cheap at the top of the Reds lineup if you are going there. 4300 is a good price for him. 2900 is an aggressively good price on FanDuel. Not off to the greatest start. He's stolen two bases. He has created runs above average, and he's getting on base. That's enough, especially if we're thinking that they're going to be playing and scoring their runs station to station a little bit or not knocking the ball out of the park, but uh, get a couple guys on and somebody doubles. That could be the approach against Miley today. 
So India's in play for cheap pricing. Spencer Steer getting a little bit expensive on both sites, um, but he's earned it so far. 400, 489, 775, a 375 ISO, three homers, two steals in 47 plate appearances. He was pretty good last year. 23 homers, 15 steals, 118 WRC plus, 192 ISO. Um, Been killing it out of the gate. We'll see how real it is. Um, It's a little difficult at the salary, but I think everybody around him, if you're stacking this team, is good for averaging that down, so he's fine. Christian Encarnacion Strand, not off to the greatest start. One home run on the board, just a 102 ISO and a 6 WRC plus over 50 plate appearances. Love the power bat, though. Uh, Excellent premium contact in his cup of coffee last year. Ended up with 13 home runs in 241 plate appearances. A little bit more than a cup of coffee. Um, It was like a late season call-up. But uh, really like Encarnacion Strand to get on track. And if he becomes unpopular, in addition to being cheap, so much the better. Jammer Candelario, one home run on the board in 48 plate appearances so far. A 163 ISO, a 46 WRC+. plus. Brought into this team for to hit for a little bit of power from both sides of the plate. Hasn't really done it yet, but he is cheap for a little bit of known upside in this spot. It's just, again, we're not really power hunting against Wade Miley here. Stuart Fairchild off to a good start. Four stolen bases and 97 WRC plus is fine. He's getting on at a 391 clip over 23 plate appearances. If that continues, he'll improve the, the run marks. Braves Mets postponed. Thank you, Aaron Davis. Down to a six game slate. Let me know if this one goes postponed after we finish talking about it. How special and amazing is Ellie De La Cruz? You guys see the inside the park home run the other day, I assume. Um, my favorite of the various replays, tweets, overlays, and everything that anybody did was somebody did a, uh, the 3d modeling, um, speed tracker around the bases and they overlaid his, uh, inside the Parker against the, the pure home run that he hit, um, in the two plate appearances before that. And on the inside, the Parker, he was at third base in the same amount of time that it took him to reach first base in his home run trot. It was 30 seconds around the bases for the home run trot and like 14 seconds around the bases for the inside, the Parker. Um, but Ellie is just absolutely special on any given slate. He's off to a decent start over 45 plate appearances. We're at 293. Most importantly to me, 356 in the on base department. That is crucial. For Ellie, this is Ellie, right? Yeah, <laughs> that is uh, pretty crucial for Ellie, and that's 356, despite just a 6.7 percent walk rate and the abysmal 37.8 percent strikeout rate that is still a problem for him. But as long as he's getting on, hitting a little bit, um, especially if he's hitting for power, two home runs on the board, six stolen bases so far, 293 ISO, 585 slug, 147 WRC plus. Let's keep it rolling. Uh, at the very least, so far, he's justifying his incredibly high pricing on both sides for a six hitter. Santiago Espinal, kind of weak at the bottom end. Luke Maley, a little bit of pop as a catcher. He's got one home run on the board. Uh, Will Benson, very interesting, 3,900. Lefty-lefty, not great, but a lot of premium contact from him um, and just a really good baseball player, right? Just a, a guy with power, with speed. He's a five-tool kind of guy, maybe maybe like lighter than superstar caliber five tools, but he's got all five tools. So I like Benson a lot. 325 ISO, two homers, two steals, over 44 plate appearances to start the season, a 119 WRC+. plus. Last year in 329 plate appearances, 11 homers, 19 steals, a 128 WRC plus, and a 223 ISO. So definitely if we're stacking this team, don't leave out Will Benson just because he's hitting eighth in a lefty-lefty spot. Cruz had speed for days. Oh, Devin had it first. (laughs) Oh, thanks. Yep, there you go, Dev. Thanks. (laughs) I thought you were saying uh, credit to Devin Scott for uh, saying Cruz has speed for days, which is also, I'm sure he would say. Um, So if this game plays, Hunter Green is a strong yes, um, but be wary with the weather. Like if it looks like it's going to delay, you might want to shop around elsewhere. Uh, But I love the pitcher and I love the strikeout upside. The Brewers would be a yes as a hedge stack, especially the top, um, call it the top five. And it gets a little bit dicier toward the bottom. Uh, but Bryce Turang may be an effective wraparound. Reds would be like a moderate yes. I would have some, but it wouldn't be a usual Reds at home kind of a spot for me. Just given how, and again, these guys could go out and hit four home runs against Wade Miley today. It's not like he's a not hittable pitcher. It just does induce a lot of soft contact, is fairly decent over time at limiting home run opportunities. So we take that away from the Reds, and you can see it in the home run model. It's only Encarnacion Strand over the ma- over halfway to the magic number. So it's a little bit problematic, plus the weather. 
not my favorite stack on the on the day. Cubby's in the pods. Yeah, I do think it is the uh it would have to be the Giants. Um I'm not sure where you could check where you could check that actually. Now I'm curious. I'm just gonna Google MLB pinch hit tracker. Uh nope. <laughs> it's gotta it's, maybe Statcast has it somewhere. It's got to be on there on one of these sites. I'll, I'll, uh, if I can remember, I'll try and look around for it. Uh, but the Giants are, are pretty notorious for uh, mixing and matching and playing the platoon game and uh, and pinch hitting. So it's probably still them. Dylan Cease, top projected starter. I forgot to show the uh, pitcher board at the top of the show. So Cease all the way at the top of the board. Hunter Green close to him. Uh, I mentioned Marcus Stroman at very high prices in my mind, especially on FanDuel. 10-1 is crazy for Marcus Stroman. I get it. It's a very good spot for him against Miami. He's not under too much threat of power. Could find a few additional strikeouts, but I don't know. More expensive than Hunter Green, more expensive than Dylan Cease. He's more of a Cutter Crawford, Cody Bradford type to me. So I don't love the pricing on Stroman, but he projects out well. He projects out competitively to the top of the board. Um, and if we lose Hunter Green, obviously he's right there. Crawford, I think, is playable against the Ori- against the Orioles. Bradford, I think, is playable against Oakland. I don't really have a ton of faith in either of these guys. No real faith in him against Cincinnati. I just think maybe he keeps them off the home run board. We already mentioned this one I don't really have a ton of faith in. Kind of targeting that one with bats on the other side, especially if he gets popular. Don't love Hendo. Don't want stripling against the t- uh, against the rangers don't really want lugo against the astros this game's already postponed so you lose quintana you lose winans and i'm not taking ryan weathers against the yanks so this is a thin pitching slate i meant to address this at the top of the show um so you really do have to consider like the crawfords the bradfords and the irvins of the world and maybe even hendrix um if you want to get it all cheap on the DraftKings slate so it's probably cutter crawford um, at 7,900 as your, your value pitcher of the day over there. I am skeptical about this one. And I'm, I'm a little bit more faith in Cutter Crawford than Cole Irvin. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But it's a very thin pitching slate. Might be a day where it just pays to go to guys like Dylan Cease. Um, 9,300 is a pretty good price on FanDuel. 10-2 is aggressively expensive for him on DraftKings, but he's earned it over time. 30.2% strikeout rate to start this year in his first two starts, 10 and two-thirds innings. Last year, over 177 in 33 starts, he had a 27.3% strikeout rate. 10.1% walks is too high. 1.42 whip is too high. Um, Just a 6.2% barrel. 2.42% home runs. He was good at limiting home runs and barrels the year before that. Was better for hard hit rate and exit velocity the year before that as well. 31.2% hard hits, 86 miles an hour of, uh, call it 87 miles an hour of exit velo. That spiked along with some of the other numbers last year. So it was something up a little bit last year, but still had a 13.6% swinging strike rate. Still a very good strikeout pitcher. 30.4% strikeout rate with a 15% swinging strike rate in 2022 potentially dominant source of strikeouts um he's going up against a cub lineup cubby's lineup that has a 21 percent strikeout rate so far this year was it 24.1 percent for that group of hitters last year so some small sample in here a little bit like you've got miguel amaya at just 14.3 percent over 21 plate appearances granted you've also got miles mastroboni at 33.3 over six so it comes and goes but let's call it around you know 22 24 22 to 24 percent somewhere in that range so there are some K's on deck for uh, Dylan C's tonight. It's a Cubs lineup that I like a lot. Makes me a little bit fearful about Dylan C's with the walks. If he loses it on walks, it's going to be a bad spot for him because this Cubs team is very good at drawing walks. 14.2% walk rate so far this year, 10.1% last year. And we've talked already about their on base. We'll skip Master Boney and his six plate appearances for now because I don't want to ruin the number. The top eight hitters in the confirmed version of the Cubs lineup have an average on base percentage so far this season of 382. It's pretty good. Last year, that on base percentage, including Master Boney over 149 plate appearances, was 329. But if we 
take out the bottom two guys and their moderate samples and will also kill 81 plate appearances from whoever that is. The guys who actually played a lot, 346. So these Cubbies are good at getting on base. That was Michael Bush that was the 80-something plate appearances. Um, they're good run creators. You can see outside of Cody Bellinger, basically everybody who's playing every day has a very good WRC plus to start the season. There's a little bit of power. There is speed up and down this lineup, even though they've only got one stolen base for the confirmed lineup so far. Ian Happ can steal bases. Cody Bellinger can even swipe a base or two. So we've got a little bit of speed to work with. Um, good power up and down the lineup. Two home runs apiece for Cody Bellinger and Seiya Suzuki so far. Chris Morell at three. Dansby Swanson's got two and a stolen base. So I definitely would hedge some Dylan C shares, especially if we get over the top with it, with some Cub stacks on the other side. Seiya Suzuki's hit everything hard so far this year. He was doing that last year. 48% hard hits, 10.5% barrels. Two home runs on the board already this year and could have more. 209 ISO, 153 WRC plus for him. Bellinger, I do think he's going to see a quick turnaround. As long as we don't dip back to like the 30% strikeout range, I think we'll be okay. 209, 314, 372 to start the season, just a 77 WRC plus. At least he's homered twice. He's fairly affordable at 3,300, 5,000. Morell is cheap for the power that he brings. He's got three home runs in a 279 ISO this year. Last year, he had a 15.5% barrel rate, a 50% hard hit rate over 429 plate appearances. Turned it into 26 home runs in a 260 ISO in that sample. He only costs 4300 at third base on DraftKings. 3400 with triple position eligibility is a fair price for him on, uh, on FanDuel, but he's at a discount on DraftKings at third base. That's a really good spot. Especially if, you know, He's not one of, one to really draw many walks, and he does strike out a lot, even though he hasn't so far this year. But if you get a couple guys on base ahead of him or a couple opportunities with guys on base throughout the game, really like the spot for Chris Morrell to do some damage. 7.23 to lead the team in uh, the home run model. The one issue is Dylan Cease, not incredibly targetable for Bauer. Michael Bush has a little bit of pop from the left side, 2,800 on both sides, first and third base eligibility on FanDuel, just first on uh, DraftKings. He's got a homer on the board, dead even uh, with league average for run creation so far this season, but a kid whose bat they believe in a little bit. Last year, just 81 plate appearances, two homers, a stolen base. But premium spot in the lineup, hitting between Morell and Dansby Swanson as a lefty in this spot for very cheap. Gotta like that a little. Dansby, 4,400, still too cheap on DraftKings. 3,600, correctly priced on FanDuel. Two homers, a stolen base, 243 ISO, 141 WRC plus so far. Talkman gets you a little bit of on-base percentage. Miguel Amaya is at least a cheap option at catcher. He's out to an okay start in the triple slash uh, over 21 plate appearances, but so far 25% below average grading runs. Last year, 6% below average grading runs across 156. And Master Boney was 29% below average grading runs across 149. So he's kind of an afterthought. But one through one through six, one through seven conservatively. I don't dislike this Cubs team. Hendricks, 5,900. So given that the bargain bin is as short as it is, you could maybe get away with rolling the dice with Hendricks a little because he's so, so cheap. I mean, 6,200, I mean, he is the highest ranked of the guys in that, like, very cheap range if we're ignoring Cole Irvin especially. It's just he's very difficult to trust. He really doesn't come with much strikeout upside. You're just hoping for six clean innings and a bonus, um, and that means that the Cubbies are going to have to beat Dylan Cease. So it's just a lot to ask from Hendricks in this spot. Going up against a decent Padres lineup. He only struck out 16.1% in 137 innings last year. 18.5% was a little better over 84 and a third the year before that. 4.80 ERA, but a 4.46 XFIP. 3.74 ERA last year, but a 4.42 XFIP. Another guy doesn't allow a lot of premium contact. 4.21% home runs. That's, that's a little higher than I was expecting. 9.9% um, barrels. This was an ugly year for him for contact, actually. This year in a larger sample was very good. 31.3% hard hits, 85.2 miles an hour of exit velo, 2.25% home runs. So far this year, it hasn't been a good start. I think I've got that in the article. 
Uh, three and two thirds against Texas at Texas in his first start. Gave up five earned runs. I think he gave up five earned runs in both his starts, but it was against the Rangers and the Dodgers. Um, so five earned runs in his first start, um, two home runs and nine hits at Texas. Struck out two, walked two. Then uh, in a home start in Wrigley against the Dodgers, lasted four innings, faced 22 Dodgers, struck out four. Not bad against that team. Walked two, allowed five earned runs on a home run and <laughs> eight hits. Um so not a not what I call a good pitcher, kind of a soft tosser, kind of a contact oriented starter. But since there's nobody else in the bargain bin, I, I I don't think I take him out of optimizers if I'm building lineups on DraftKings. Let's put it that way. I don't think I include him at fifty nine hundred on FanDuel. I think FanDuel you just go go to the higher end tonight or go to those, you know, capable mid range guys and take a take a shot against like the Orioles. Vladdy, 459-foot home run, 114 miles an hour. Damn. That's a shot. So, Hendricks is, like, uncomfortably on your DraftKings SP2 list. Um, but don't get carried away with shares. I don't really believe. Xander Bogarts, very good player. Up and down start to the season. Down to an 83 WRC+. Plus, but he did that to us throughout last year and finished with very strong numbers. He's only 4,400 at second base on DraftKings. He is still a shortstop on FanDuel. They'll find out about his uh, playing second base at some point. $3,000 on FanDuel. I think he's worth the investment on both sites. 6.96 in the home run model against a contact-oriented pitcher. You've got Fernando Tatis Jr. at 12.19 to lead the team in the power index. 9.79 for Manny Machado. Pretty reasonable three guys in the top end of this stack. Then we get Jake Cronenworth, who is out to a very strong start. I said it yesterday. I will not take it away from him. 288, 356, 462, 128 WRC plus with a homer on the board over 60 plate appearances. Good for him. Still cheap. 3,600 at first base on DraftKings, 2,900 first and second base on FanDuel. I like him better as a second baseman, especially since it's not blocking or um, forcing you to put one of these two guys at the util spot. So if I can go shortstop, outfield, second base, third base, I kind of like that as the way to put together this Padres team. Either that or you skip Cronenworth and you drop down to Hassan Kim and you just put him in at second base. Um, so either way, I think they're stackable. Like one, two, three, four, six at the very least. Jerickson Profar is having a good start to the season. He's leading the team with a 143 WRC plus over 50 plate appearances. Uh, this is not going to hold, but he's out to a good start. 3,100, 2,700. I wouldn't go out of my way for him. I would still leapfrog him to get to Hassan Kim, to get to Luis Camposano at 3,400 on DraftKings. I think he's in a good spot. 326, 341, 465 to start his season. 125 WRC plus with a homer on the board. Fairly cheap catcher. Decent contact profile last year. Jackson Merrill, their premium rookie. 300, 378, 425 to start his career over 45 plate appearances. Hits from the left side, still only cost 2900 on DraftKings, where he's an outfielder correctly. 2500 where he's a shortstop on FanDuel. A lot of shortstops on this team on FanDuel. There are four shortstop eligible players on this team on FanDuel. Like you think they would take a hint from that and just be like, hey, let's check where these guys are actually playing this year. <laughs> let's find out who's in the Orioles minor league system that might get called up. I love the blue side, but damn, <laughs> sometimes you got to shake your head. Uh, but good pricing on Jackson Merrill at the bottom of the lineup. And then Tyler Wade, at the very least, he's the dead men still on FanDuel. Outfield, second base, and shortstop eligible. He's made 28 plate appearances. He's 5% below average for run creation, but he doesn't cost anything. He's a $2,800 third baseman on DraftKings. The positioning kind of sucks. The price is not as low as it could be. So he's not the same value play, I don't think, nearly close on DraftKings as he is on FanDuel, where you could just stick him in a middle infield spot at the dead men. And he's slashing 250, 357, 292. The on base is all right. He's gotten two stolen bases. He's provided a little bit of value in that spot already this season. So it's not totally off the board to use Tyler Wade as a wraparound and just go like, you know, Wade at second, Bogarts, Tatis, and Machado. I think that's reasonable and it lowers you from, if you went straight line through the top four, it's a $3,200 average, a $13,000 total. If you went with those guys and Kim, it's a $3,300 average, a 13-2 total. If you went with those guys and Tyler Wade is the wraparound from the minimum, it lowers you to 3,025 average and a 12,100 total. That buys you a hitter or two. That buys you a better pitcher. So I like those wraparound plays when they're somewhat effective hitters. 
And Tyler Wade hasn't been great in his major league career, but he's had his moments. He's been all right as like a utility man, you know, 25th guy on your <laughs> on your active roster. So Dylan Cease is a big yes. Hedge it with some Cubs if you're building a bunch of lineups. Padres are a reasonably good yes against Kyle Hendricks in an afternoon game. Um, and Hendricks is in that bargain bin. I do think you could roll some very thin dart throw type plays on DraftKings with Hendricks. I wouldn't play him on FanDuel. <laughs> Larry, Larry C. called out the uh, the Vladdy home run. Houston lineup in. All lineups are in now. Excellent. We'll grab that one when we get to that game. Remind me. Devin's got C. Stroman and Bradford. The fourth would be Crawford as far as uh, starting pitchers today. Yeah, I, I agree with that list. Benson hit his first home run off of a lefty the other day, says Travis Windham. I missed that that was the case, but good call there, buddy. Good note. Always good to see. Reds Brewers lineups just updated in Sabersim, so they're probably going to play then. Um, that's just Sabersim catching up to what happened an hour ago. Those lineups came out a while ago. Um, this one, again, I think this one plays. It's now pretty sunny out. Uh, I, we're also talking about a game that starts in a couple hours from now, but right now it looks pretty good. I'd be going to the game if I was going to the game. Uh, so no issues with it. Do not play Ryan Weathers in Yankee Stadium against this Yankees team. Uh, look at all those power hitting righties and the lefties are Anthony Rizzo, who's good lefty lefty. Juan Soto, who's one of the best hitters of ever. <laughs> Soto is legitimately to start his career at age 25 or whatever he is. So far, he's on track with like four other guys in Major League history. Uh, you know, So he is legitimately, so far, one of the best hitters in, in Major League history. So I don't worry about him lefty-lefty against Ryan Weathers, is my point. Alex Verdugo, kind of a station-to-station -station, uh, slap hitter. He does have two home runs on the season, um, you know, showing a little bit of power this year. Lefty-lefty maybe gets him a little bit, but I wasn't really leaning in his direction anyway. John Birdie, Jose Trevino, kind of afterthoughts at the bottom, but Birdie has some speed. Trevino, not much of a hitter, but he is a right-handed bat. They're not going to roll uh, Wells, who's a lefty in there, against Ryan Weathers. But Weathers is like a replacement-level talent. He did go... First start of the season, four innings, struck out five Pirates, but allowed three earned runs on seven hits. Not a bad start, but not a not a good start. We were stacking against him in both of these. Second start, the Cardinals disappointed me against him. He struck out six Cardinals. He walked three, allowed a solo home run and three hits. Three total runs, but only one of them earned. Um, that was a decent game, so he's shown a little bit of life in two starts to start this season. I think the Ryan Weathers showing a little bit of life balloon is about to get popped in Yankee Stadium tonight. He's also walked 11.1% in that small sample. He's got a 4.67 ER, uh, XFIP under the 4.0 ERA. He's given up a ridiculous amount of premium contact to only, have only given up a couple of home runs. 19.2% barrels, 93.5 miles an hour of exit velo. Yeah, it's mostly you know angled downward so far, but you're going to throw these in uh, that exit velo at Soto, Judge, Stanton, to a lesser extent Rizzo and Torres, Volpe even at the top of the lineup. Come on, buddy. Not going to be Ryan Weathers' day. Your last year, 4.67% home run rate uh, on much better contact. 655 ERA over 57 and two-thirds, 12 starts, 556 XFIP, just a 16.7% strikeout rate and a similar 11.3% walk rate. Very small sample over here. That's not what we're talking about. Ryan Weathers is not a good pitcher. Uh, the Yankees are a potentially elite offense this year. Anthony Volpe moving up to the top spot in the lineup. I'm not a fan. I I love I love what the kid's done at the plate this year. I think it would be wise to leave him in the sixth spot and let him continue doing what he's doing. Why fuck with it? He was not good in the leadoff spot last year. Gleber Torres is not out to a great start, but that doesn't really matter because I know that Gleber Torres is a good hitter who doesn't strike out, gets on base at a reasonable reasonable rate, and can fill that role. You'll get DJ LeMayhew back, and he'll probably jump into that spot at some point. 
hell, if you wanted to, I wouldn't really argue with just playing the old fashioned and saying, hey, John Birdie can hit lead off today. I don't love screwing with the kid's good start. I really don't. That said, he's off to a fantastic start. He's getting on base at a ridiculous 444 clip. 375, 444, 600, 225 ISO, creating runs 108% better than average over his 46 plate appearances. He's got two homers. He's stolen three bases. He's been a stick of dynamite so far. Just why screw with it? I love the spot in the lineup. It could be Larry from chat in this leadoff spot, and I would play him in stacks ahead of Soto and Judge and just hope that he gets hit by a pitch. You just need somebody to get on base ahead of these two hitters. They're going to do this all season where Soto will walk, Judge will home run. Soto will hit a homer, Judge will follow it with uh, getting on base ahead of Stanton. This is just a ridiculous stretch of hitters. So whoever is hitting in this spot, you're going to love by default. The fact that you get Volpe's great start and his great counting stats for just 4,400 at shortstop on DraftKings makes it a killer DFS spot. 3,300 on FanDuel is probably still a little bit cheap if the, if the turnaround is real. I just don't love that the actual real-life Yankees are moving him up already. That said, we just stacked this team from at least 1 through 7. One through six if you're not sold on Verdugo, lefty-lefty, but I don't think it's a problem, and you're going to get into the bullpen pretty quickly here, I think. Soto and Judge in any situation against basically anybody, but especially in this spot, figure out a way to pay for him. Giancarlo Stanton is tearing the cover off the ball right now. Three home runs, a 300 ISO, a 134 WRC+. plus. Um, when he's not homering, he's, well, for one thing, striking out, not walking, 39% strikeouts and a 2.4% walk rate. But when he is making contact, it is utterly elite contact. He smashed a double down the line in last night's game, I want to say. Uh, just you, you, We've got good Stanton on our hands right now. Enjoy it while it lasts. 4,700 is too cheap on, Fan, on DraftKings. 3,200 is too cheap on FanDuel. Knock on wood, he stays healthy. If he does, could be a monster season. Anthony Rizzo, again, no real diminishment. Little bit in power over the course of his career, lefty-lefty. But the triple slashes, it holds up. The WRC Plus holds up uh, and is extremely positive. It was like, one high teens WRC plus for his career lefty lefty no issues with Rizzo and I think he's far too cheap at 3,900 2,700 you'll probably get three plate appearances against righties out of the bullpen from him or you know maybe two um so I still like the home run upside he's over the magic number even against Weathers for home run upside you've got Volpe just under it at 8.83 the next four hitters all over it to very far over it uh, Gleyber Torres was over it when he was in the leadoff spot. Now he dips to 8.89, but he's my home run pick of the day. I'm sticking with Glaber. Love Glaber. 4,600 on DraftKings, too cheap. 3,000 on FanDuel, too cheap. Just prefer him when he's leading off ahead of uh, Soto and Judge. But now he can clean up for those guys from the sixth spot. Birdie is very cheap. Um, 3,200 is an effective price, third base, and shortstop on the DraftKings slate. You can get there. What I really like about Birdie is the FanDuel spot, uh, slate where you get three position eligibility I would play him either at uh, probably third base or I'd probably play him at third base and, and get Volpe and Glaber in a lineup. Um, but he's a reasonable pivot, especially with Glaber hitting down here at second base to save 800 bucks and use him as a wraparound back to these guys. I think that's in play for Birdie. I would do that with Birdie, not Trevino. Trevino, really not much of a hitter. Every now and then he goes for a home run. He hit four last year in 168 plate appearances, uh, 11 the year before in 353, mostly here for defense behind the plate. The reason Birdie's at least somewhat interesting, 345 on base last year, just stole 16 bases, 324 the year before that, but led the National League with 41 steals. So you get him on as a table setter, maybe he steals a bag, adds some points, gets himself into scoring position ahead of Volpe or Judge Soto. It's a very easy way to average down the salary of these three guys. You're putting two gaps in there, but I don't really care about that. So if you go Birdie, like I would... In that situation, birdie either at short or second and leave third base open. And then the three outfielders. And now I'm getting Aaron Judge and Juan Soto for $3,350 apiece with Giancarlo Stanton in there too instead of $3,900, $4,100. It's pretty effective. By the same token, it's third and short. You could do it on DraftKings and go like that. That cuts you to $4,900. So you're getting Soto and Judge for below $5,000. That's not bad. You also get Volpe, Stanton, and you're taking John Birdie along for the ride. Granted, you could also do kind of similar things just with the way that Rizzo's priced, Torres is priced. For that straight line five man, that's still put that's a five thousand sixty average. 
So it's not as impactful on the DraftKings slate as it is on FanDuel, having him at 2,200. It's an interesting play. I, I like looking and clicking those things, and John Birdie's not going to be popular today. So it's also a differentiation play. Bear in mind that you're taking a guy who is not the best hitter. He did go 296, 345, 406 last year, but only seven home runs. Doesn't really have any power to speak of. But that's not what he's here for. On the Marlins side, um, so let's talk Marcus Stroman. Good over his first two starts. Hasn't given up a run yet. 3.70 XFIP underneath that. Just a 20.8% strikeout rate. Very good with premium contact so far. Just 2.9% barrels. This is just a couple incidents of, uh, of contact at all. Last year was a little bit worse in terms of the exit velo and the hard hit rate, but he keeps the ball down very effectively. He's one of those guys, uh, just a ground ball pitcher, 5% barrel rate, 3 degree average launch angle last year, just a 1.57% home run rate against 2.81 the year before that on a 6.6% barrel and 7 degree average launch, a little bit more launch that year. Um, but very, very effective over time at limiting home run power. Not a big-time strikeout guy, but could easily go out there, eat some innings, win you both bonuses on the FanDuel slate, win you the DraftKings uh, win bonus, win you the win bonus, clunky, um, get you to the DraftKings win bonus, and have a very effective day. Um, and the Marlins really don't present that much of a challenge. Just a 21.9% strikeout rate, 20.9% by this group of hitters last year. There are some gettable guys for strikeouts in there, like Jazz Chisholm is not uh, invulnerable to strikeouts. 30.7% in half a season last year, 23.9% so far this year. Jesus Sanchez certainly strikes out, so does Timmy Anderson. 23.3% last year, 33.3%. I still have no idea where Timmy's going to land this year. The average is there. The on base is like around a Timmy Anderson on base, but there's been no power, but he's stolen two bases. Work in progress for Tim Anderson's comeback. Um, continuing the theme, I think, you know, the Brian De La Cruz is a little bit gettable. You do have Luis Larraiz at the top of the lineup with just a microscopic sc- strikeout rate last year. Uh, but he's not out to a great start this season without uh, Jorge Soler backing him up. Back-to-back batting titles in separate leagues. I think he'll be fine, and I think we'll see him round into form for average really quickly. But not off to a great start. And then, like, less threatening power than they had last year. I, I think it's a good spot for Stroman. I definitely think he's on the board for shares. I just hate paying 10-1 for him as the most expensive pitcher on a slate that's got Hunter Green on it, that's got Dylan Cease on it, that project out higher than him. Just a weird price fit. At 96 on DraftKings, he's a similarly weird price fit. But again, it's a very, very, like, uniquely short pitching slate today. So... I do think you embrace the uh, the high pricing and just roll with Marcus Stroman's upside against the Marlins. If he gets base hit to death by guys like Luis Arraez hitting the ball uh, on the ground but through the infield, that could be problematic. Josh Bell does have some power. Only one home run on the board over 53 this year. Only hit 22 last year, 17 the year before that. Somewhere in there, there's a big year. I think it was 2019. I think you got to go back that far. Thirty-seven home runs in twenty nineteen. So you got to go back a ways for Josh Bell's uh, real power, but he was—he's been an okay, like medium power hit over the last few seasons. A reasonable option if you're choosing to stack against Stroman, who I'm sure will be popular despite the high price. Um, and if you target that, you know you're you're targeting opponents who have not only a very popular pitcher but a very expensive one, so therefore they're going to be at weaker points with their stacks. Um, but you're also taking on a weak stack to do it. So it's it's kind of a mixed bag of an approach strategy-wise. Jake Berger's got tremendous power, third and first base eligible on both sides, 4,800 on DraftKings, 3,400 on FanDuel. Out to an okay start, just a 94 WRC plus and a 174 ISO, but two home runs on the board, the 261 average. Needs to get on base a little bit more. He's only walking 5.9% of the time. That matches his rate from last season exactly. Striking out less so far this year. I like Jake Berger. I like the contact profile. I think he could get back to 30 home runs this year. It's just you know, not a great spot against a ground ball pitcher, a guy who is very good at limiting power. Jazz Chisholm from the left side, Jesus Sanchez from the left side. Okay power marks, but these guys would be higher against a lot of righties in, uh, in Yankee Stadium here. 3,400 for Jazz, 5,100 on DraftKings. Highest projected player, highest uh, second highest home run rating in the home run model today. If I'm stacking Marlins, I'm not skipping Jazz Chisholm, but he doesn't give me a reason to go to the Marlins, really. Sanchez, same thing to a lesser, uh, with less enthusiasm. I do like the bat. I do think he comes around for power if he manages to stay healthy this year. 
Last year, he hit uh, 14 home runs and 402 plate appearances, but was in and out of the lineup with injuries. Timmy, like I said, out to an okay average start. Reasonably close to where he's been career-wise on base. Has stolen two bases, but a .022 ISO. No homers. 3% barrels. 39.1% hard hits. It's a real mixed bag. 2500 on FanDuel is an effective price, so is 36 on DraftKings. Another guy who could hit three balls on the ground through the infield and just frustrate Marcus Stroman today. Brian De La Cruz, Nick Gordon, Nick Fortes down the bottom of the lineup. I do think De La Cruz is a good hitter. The other two guys a little bit more skippable. De La Cruz off to a decent start. One home run on the board, but just a .078 ISO, a 76 WRC+. Plus. Needs to do a little bit better. Yankees, gigantic yes. Marcus Stroman, too expensive, but... Considering that the slate is so short, you have to kind of pay it. Ryan Weathers, gigantic no. Marlins, uh, not really a good play because there's not a ton of power upside against Stroman. Um, you just have to hope for those base hits and, uh, you know, a station to station kind of game. One that everybody wants to talk about. Cole Irvin going up against Cutter Crawford. So, Cole Irvin. We can start there. A little bit of weather in this one also. Medium risk of weather. But seems like it's going to play. Cole Irvin uh, faced Kansas City on April 2nd in his one start of the season. Worked five innings, allowed four earned runs on seven hits to Kansas City. Struck out three, walked two. Don't have all that much faith in Cole Irvin against these Red Sox. Last year, in a bigger sample, 77 and a third over 12 starts, just a 20.2% strikeout rate with a 4.42 ERA, 4.47 xFIP. Gave up some barrels, gave up some home runs. Not egregiously bad in home runs, exit velo, or hard hits, but a lot of barrels going up against a home run and hitting kind of a team. In 30 starts in 2022, he had a 3.98 ERA, was fairly effective, a 4.35 xFIP, not bad. Only struck out 17.3%, though. That's not really DFS quality. Just walk 4.9%, which is fine. 9.6% swinging strike rate and only a 25.7% CSW. Gave up a similar amount of barrels, 3.37% home runs. I think he's pretty targetable here with these Red Sox bats. And at the absolute worst, he's certainly not an imposing lefty for hitters like Rafael Devers, Tristan Casas. You can kind of see it in the fact that the Red Sox went with four lefties in the top four hitters and stacked two of them together. Like, this is not a Red Sox lineup that is saying, oh boy, there's a lefty on the mound, let's uh, let's plan for that. So, I really don't mind it. And I think, I, I read in more than one place this morning, just glancing around, that um, the Red Sox have been bad against lefties so far this year. I'm going to dispute that. Jaron Duran, from the leadoff spot. 319, 373, 383 with a 120 WRC+, plus a homer and six stolen bases overall. He's made 17 plate appearances, it's an extremely small sample. But in 17 lefty-lefty plate appearances so far this season, he's slashing 400, 471, 400 with a 163 WRC+. Last year against lefties, in a more complete sample, 289, 327, 422. That'll play. The on-base isn't exactly where I would want it, but the 289 average, he's hitting the ball a little bit. He can use his speed effectively with that, if nothing else. Pablo Reyes, uh, is he in the lineup? I had him next. Uh, he is in the lineup, but he's hitting six. Dips down the lineup. Uh, righty bat there. Fills three positions on FanDuel at 2,400. Yada, yada. I'm obviously just looking at the article right now. Um, last year, Reyes was 287, 339, 377. Two homers, seven steals, and 185 plate appearances. Not dead at the plate. Rafi Devers, the other lefty that I was looking for here. Two home runs, a 222 ISO, but a bad overall start over 42 plate appearances in his triple slash. In the 12 opportunities he's had against fellow lefties so far this year, he's at 273, 333, 364. The slug isn't where you want it. He hasn't hit a home run against a lefty yet. But last year, he hit nine of his 33 home runs against lefties. He had a 215 ISO against lefties, a 119 WRC plus against lefties, 273, 335, 488. He's fine. Tyler O'Neill's been the best player in baseball over the first couple of weeks of the season. 344, 488, 906 with six home runs, a stolen base, creating runs 176% better than average. Could be a big, big year for Tyler O'Neill. Player I've liked for a long time. He's on the Dynasty team. Uh, and then Tristan Casas, moving up the lineup from where he was in the projected version of the lineup. One home run in 47 plate appearances. Hit 24 last year with a 226 ISO. Uh, in his 11 plate appearances against Sam Hannon pitching this year, 
Uh, he's done well. I didn't actually put the numbers in here, it seems. Uh, last year, he hit four of his 24 home runs, slash 214, 361, 456, with a 241 ISO and a 121 WRC plus in 97 plate appearances against lefties last year. None of that is bad. The average is bad. But he hit for power, four of his 24 home runs and a 241 ISO. Created runs 21% better than average. Got on base at a 361 clip against lefties. It's only 97 plate appearances, but Tristan Casas doesn't really suffer lefty-lefty either. I'm really not sure where the buzz is coming from, from Cole Irvin, other than the fact that like he exists and he is priced at 66-68. Projects out okay, but that's not really a strong mark. Projects out okay on DraftKings for the money? You're here? Actually, you're a little higher if I sort by DraftKings. He moves up a spot. You're here if we're sorted by DraftKings? So yeah, price-wise, bargain bin-wise, it's there. But I don't really think matchup-wise, and as Devin was saying, in Fenway Park, I don't see it. I really don't. So um, I'm not going to uh, get on board with uh, whoever in the industry is is pushing that narrative. I'm stacking Red Sox against Cole Irvin. Like I said, they're in my placeholder right now, and I kind of like them here, especially if they're not going to be popular. I think they're effectively priced. The fact that I can get Rafi Devers for 33 on FanDuel, I will absolutely pay that price for Rafael Devers, who hits lefties pretty effectively. 5,200 is cheap, but not quite as cheap on the DraftKings slate. Tyler O'Neill is still only 4,800. I don't know how that's possible on DraftKings. He's 3,600 on FanDuel. Again, he's been the best hitter in baseball over the first two weeks of the season. You can see it again, 176% better than average. Not 76% better, 176% better than average so far. Romy Gonzalez is in the lineup at the dead minute. Second base, 2,000 on uh, both sides. Second base and outfield on FanDuel. He's made one plate appearance and uh, went over and is 100% worse than average for run creation, but we'll forgive it in one plate appearance. Three homers, seven stolen bases, pretty weak triple slash in 97 plate appearances last year. In 109 plate appearances the year before, two homers, a, a 69 WRC+. plus. Kind of an afterthought, but it, you know he's kind of an, also in an interesting spot in the lineup. It's a little bit weird to have him there. Pablo Reyes may be a little bit more playable. Triple position eligible on the FanDuel slate, including multiple infield spots for 24. Short and second for 25 on DraftKings. A playable part from the right side. Uh, Yoshida, I didn't look up because he wasn't in the projected. Let me pull up his lefty-lefty from last year. Yoshida to start this season is at just uh, 167, 286, 167 against uh, lefties. 39 WRC+. plus Hasn't gotten off to a great start. Last year... In 144 plate appearances against lefties, he hit three home runs and slashed 273, 347, 398. No real power, 125 ISO, but created runs 2% better than average. Not far off of a better on base percentage, in fact. Not far off of his batting average. So I think Yoshida is kind of is who he is at worst here. 4,000 on the DraftKings slate is pretty playable. 2,800 on the FanDuel slate. I wouldn't completely skip him if I'm building a bunch of Red Sox stacks. Sedan Rafaela drops to the bottom spot. Maybe you consider him as a right-handed wraparound play with a little bit of speed, getting back up to the top of the lineup here. 3,500 on DraftKings, 2,700 with multi-position eligibility on FanDuel. A lot of flexibility, a lot of cheap pricing for the Red Sox on both sides. More flexibility on FanDuel than on, on DraftKings. But they're cheap. I like this spot for Boston. I'm, I'm anti-Cole Irvin here. I think you can get away with it, and I think you probably should have some shares at the DraftKings price just because there's nobody else. I don't. I think I said it before. I think I like Hendricks a little bit better for the six hundred dollar discount. There's not a ton of daylight between those two projections. Hendo could give you five if the Cubbies manage to beat Dylan Cease. Maybe he gets the win. It's thin either way. Taking the Orioles against Cutter Crawford here. Uh, eighty two hundred for Crawford on FanDuel. Seventy nine on DraftKings. Pretty effective start to the season. Twenty eight point six percent strikeouts over ten and two third. He had a twenty five point six percent strikeout rate in one hundred twenty nine and a third last year. Twenty three one in a smaller sample the year before. Four oh four ERA. Four point three two xFIP. I think he's proven himself to be like a, a decent middle of the road kind of a little bit better than league average type starter in moderate sample sizes so far. So I think he's okay for the money projects out 
okay for the money on this short pitching slate. He's the fourth highest projection at 25 on FanDuel, 12 and a half on, uh, on DraftKings. So he's in play. It's just a really good frisky Orioles lineup with a lot of good young talent in it on the other side. They add Jackson Holiday today. Happy holidays. Oh, I'm sure that's been tweeted a thousand times today. Holiday and uh, basically everybody for the Norfolk Tides has been completely destroying the minor leagues so far this season. He's the top prospect in all of baseball. Um, great baseball bloodline back to his dad, Matt Holiday. Um, just a killer, killer opportunity here on DraftKings, where he's the dead minimum. He's hitting ninth, which isn't ideal, and he's a positional blocker for Gunnar Henderson, which absolutely sucks. Gunnar needs to pick up uh, third base eligibility, I guess, soon, or, or one of them does. Second base or third base, whatever, whatever the position he's going to be. Um, we need to get multi-position on one of those guys very, very quickly because they're going to need to be played together in lineups. Gunner at the top of the lineup at 5,300, kind of kind of cheap for him. He's 37 on the FanDuel slate. Two home runs, three stolen bases, creating runs 17% better than average with a 231 ISO to start the year. On base and the average aren't where we want him in the triple slash, but who really cares? Um, he's doing just fine without it, and uh, for DFS purposes, he's giving us everything we want. Adley, one of the top catchers in baseball, 3,200 is too cheap on FanDuel, 4,900 is definitely too cheap where you need to play catchers hasn't hit any home runs not really hitting for power yet to start the season but a 128 wrc plus he's getting on at a 386 clip he's at 316 so far scored some runs driven in a few hits from both sides of the plate and he's too cheap santander hits from both sides of the plate 3400 with first base eligibility on fanduel only 4600 on DraftKings. he's got two home runs on board already 190 iso to start this season 28 homers last year with a 215 iso 33 the year before with a 214 iso Anthony Santander is a very good power hitter uh, hitting third in this lineup. Ryan O'Hearn had an out-of-nowhere strong season last year. After scuffling through multiple years uh, with Kansas City, he came out, made 368 plate appearances, went 289, 322, 480 with a 191 ISO, hit 14 home runs, was 18% better than average creating runs, was cheap every day because nobody really believed in the breakout, and he continues to be cheap, 2,600 on FanDuel with multi-position, 3,300 on DraftKings, hits from the left side against Cutter Crawford. I don't dislike the Ryan O'Hearn option, and I expect with everybody looking in different directions uh, with all the young talent on this team, He's going to probably be a little bit unpopular or at least less popular than he should be for these prices and that role in the lineup. Had a pretty killer contact profile last year, 51.5% hard hits. Not bad. Ryan Mountcastle, another great option. Very good premium contact profile over the last few seasons. Lost a few home runs maybe to the uh, park remodeling in uh, Camden Yards, but uh, we're playing in Fenway Park tonight for one. He's got power upside, 4,400, 3,400 at first base, reasonably priced on both sites. Has two home runs to start the year, or excuse me, one home run to start the year. Off to a good start with the triple slash, a 205 ISO. He's been 34% better than average creating runs. Looks like a good spot. Cedric Mullins, former 30-30 guy. Out to a rough start in terms of the triple slash. Hasn't gotten on base or hit for average yet, but two homers, two steals. We're on our way to 30-30 comeback for Cedric Mullins. 3,700, 3,000 more to the point is pretty cheap for the level of talent that he can provide at the plate. Colton Kowser destroyed spring training. He's only made 16 plate appearances since games. Plate appearances since games have started to count. Blah, 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 blah. Um, But he's at 467, 438, 733 with a 267 ISO and a 232 WRC+. And it only costs 2,400, 2,100. Kid's got power. He struggled last year in his call-up. 77 plate appearances he did this not great 60 percent worse than average grading runs uh but we're giving him a mulligan considering the talent level fairly highly ranked prospect uh, across baseball jordan westberg another kid who's been here since the start of uh since they broke camp there was uh, some talk that he would you know maybe get sent packing when jackson got called up but he's in the lineup today 2900 short and third base eligible on fanduel second base and third base for 38 on DraftKings. Just at 194, 242, 355, 26% worse than average to start the season. He was okay last year. Three homers, four steals in 228 plate appearances. And all right, triple slash, 3% worse than average for run creation. It's playable at cheap pricing, but if you're going here, like let's just go one spot further down the lineup and play Jackson Holiday. So, Red Sox. Definitely yes for me against Cole Irvin. Orioles. Pretty strong, yes. I think they'll be popular going up against Cutter Crawford. 
I think there's ways to stack that team that won't be as popular as they should be, too. Ryan O'Hearn is one. Cedric Mullins is one. Not sure about where Santander's ownership comes in, but uh, he, he tends to be less popular than he should be on a lot of slates. Mount Castle may be a little bit less popular. It's just going to be interesting with how people build lineups around the Holiday and Henderson uh, positional blocker at short. Uh, but yeah, they're on the board anyway. Uh Crawford, I would play. I think you have to kind of from the mid-range here. And I think you do have to deploy, at least on DraftKings for 6,800, some SP2 shares of Cole Irvin. I just don't go along with the industry thinking that it's a good spot. I, I think it's a little bit of a rough spot. I think you could get dinged here and cost those people. Um, but I think he is in the mix for some shares, just given the shortage of pitching on this slate, especially at the SP2 price level. This game is postponed. See how we pick up time sometimes. Hoosier Devo says, uh, swap Verdugo and Trevino for Stanton and Torres. It's ugly, but I made it work. I like that swap, buddy. Larry C., blame me for Yoshida. I have five season-long teams. I have them on three. <laughs> yeah, Devin, I, I absolutely think those are two ridiculously good bargain spots. Two just tremendous right-handed power bats. Bobby who option to triple A on Monday. Dahlbeck? I'm going to guess that's who you were talking about. Why are you going to cause me pain, Dennis? <laughs> no, I love Bobby Dahlbeck. All right, so uh, let me grab the Astros lineup real quick, and uh, we'll talk about uh, Spencer Arigetti, who was, uh, turns out, is not a uh, distant relative of Dave Rigetti. I didn't actually look that up. Maybe he is. But uh, I don't really have... He's not on either slate, so it doesn't matter for pitching shares. But I'm going to try and justify getting to some Royals here because I don't think he's necessarily all that good. Uh, of course, Fantasy Labs doesn't have it yet. Pain in the ass. Let's see what we've got in the, Oral, in the uh, Astros lineup to start. Looks pretty much like usual. Yeah, let me just grab Tuve, Alvarez, Tucker, Bregman, Jainer Diaz. Pena moves up the lineup. Jeremy Pena hitting uh, sixth. Right? Yeah. Diaz, Pena. Oh, damn it. I didn't mean to do that that way. Whatever. Totally defeats the purpose of that cop copy paste. Chad McCormick, uh, and then uh, Abreu here. And Jake Myers there. So, Arigetti, again, not on either side, but uh, last year in, we'll start with the good numbers. In 60 and two-thirds innings, eight, eight starts in double A, pitching as a 23-year-old last year, he had a 31.2% strikeout rate with a 4.15 ERA and a 4.21 XFIP. The run numbers are all right. The strikeout rate is obviously very good. He moved up to triple A. In 64 innings and 13 starts at that level as a 23-year-old, 4.68 ERA with a 5.96 xFIP, dropped to a 23.1% strikeout rate, and walked 13.4%. It is a small sample. It's unfair to completely judge him by this. He's ranked, I think, fourth organizationally as a prospect. So he's got a little bit of buzz. Um, but given those numbers in AAA, now that he's going up against a Royals team that has been kind of interesting to start the season, especially if your name's not Vinny Pascantino, um, I'm, I'm going to take some Royals bats here. That's the other team currently in my placeholder. I think this is a decent Royal squad. Every every few years, the Royals turn around with a, uh, a pretty interesting, pretty good baseball team. And I think this could be one of those years. I at least like them like one through six. I still believe in Hunter Renfro. Adam Frazier's not completely lost at the plate. Isbell, all right, fine. But I kind of like this lineup, especially against a rookie making his debut after shaky numbers in the minors. I think we fire away with some cheap Royal stacks here. Bobby Witt, the most expensive player, the only expensive player really on both sites. 
3,800 on FanDuel is probably 200 bucks too cheap. 6,300 on DraftKings, they've definitely got it right. Um, probably a little bit high, but short slate, not that many great shortstops on the board. 197 WRC plus to start the season for Bobby Witt, two homers, two steals. Hit uh, 30 homers, stole 49 bases last year. So he's okay at baseball. Michael Garcia, out to a decent start. Three home runs, one stolen base, creating runs 1% better than average. Slugging percentage is better than the on-base and the uh, and the average so far. Needs to get on a little bit more to utilize his speed. Had a 50.6% hard hit rate in a small sample last year. Potential breakout season for him in a great spot in the lineup ahead of uh, Witt, Pascantino, Perez, Melendez, and Velasquez. Pascantino's had a disastrous start to his season. A zero ISO, a negative two WRC plus so far. Uh, no ribbies, no home runs, obviously. No stolen bases. 108, 214, 108 to start the year. Uh, he's just striking out 11.9% of the time. He's matching that with his 11.9% walk rate so far over 42 plate appearances. That was also the exact rate that he struck out last year, 11.9%. That's kind of amazing. 9.6% walks last year. What I like about Pascantino, he's got a little bit of hard hit potential. You can see it. 8.8% barrels, 46.9% hard hits two years ago, 40.1% last year. A guy who hits the ball that hard and doesn't strike out, puts bat on ball that effectively, is always going to be interesting to me, especially when he's 4,300, 2,600 after a cold start to the season. Last year, he hit nine home runs, 247, 324, 437, had a 190 ISO, 103 WRC plus over 260, hit 10 home runs in 298 plate appearances the year before, created runs 37% better than average in that small sample, so... I think there's talent there from the left side going up against a rookie righty. No issues with including Pascantino in stacks. Sal Perez, still very interesting. Out to a very good start. Two home runs, 341, 370, 500, creating runs 45% better than average. He's only $4,700 where you need catchers. 3300 where you don't need catchers. I would play him on either site. My two favorite hitters in this lineup come next. MJ Melendez, Nelson Velasquez. Nelson's got two home runs on the season, slashing 323, 382, 613 to start things off. 290 ISO, a 183 WRC plus from the right side. MJ out to a killer start. 333, 421, 727, a 394 ISO. 219 WRC plus, three homers, a stolen base over the first few games. 38 plate appearances. 3,600 and 3,700 for those two hitters on DraftKings. 3,100 and 2,800 on FanDuel, you better believe they're in my outfield and in my placeholder lineup right now. Like both of those guys quite a bit. 6.88, 7.23. Home run model might be selling them a bit short. We're just dealing with short samples and estimations for uh, what Arigetti might be on the other side here. But I like the upside for for power from those two bats. Uh, I mentioned Renfro. I'll never stop talking about it. 60 home runs combined over uh, two, going back two and three years ago. Dropped to just, uh, was it 21 last year? 20 last year but that still makes for 80 home runs across three seasons it's not bad just one on the board this year in 34 plate appearances hasn't done anything at the plate but i'm still a believer that there's lurking any given slate power there and the cheaper and less popular that he gets the more i'll consider him especially when he's surrounded by adam frazier and kyle isbell which is kind of an interesting end point to a stack wouldn't use him as a wraparound you don't get that kind of quality from hunter renfro but as like an end point to like a Power hitting Perez, Melendez, Velasquez, Renfro kind of a stack. I think that's kind of interesting. The Astros, they're just playable from one through nine on any given slate. Uh, they're going up against Seth Lugo, who I think is a pretty gettable starter here. Cal Raleigh home run. Lugo last year, 23.2% strikeouts over 146 and a third, 357 ERA, a 376 XFIP. He wasn't bad, but he's very hittable. 9.6%, barrels allowed, 44.2% hard hits, 90.7 miles an hour of exit velo, 3.15% home run rate. This was relief work, probably better suited to relief work in the long term than uh, than starting, but we've got him as a starter. He's 84 on both sites, makes him kind of an awkward price fit. He's not at the top tier, he's not in the, in the bargain bin, doesn't project great against a ridiculously talented Astros team. Um, I don't know that I play Seth Lugo all that much for price. I, I doubt I would get there on FanDuel. On DraftKings, he just doesn't really make sense when I, I'll just take Cutter Crawford. If I need to get cheap, I'll take one of these guys, or I'll just pay more. I'll, I'll go up to Green Stroman. He's the only guy on that price tier on the DraftKings slate. And he's facing the Astros. Astros, a ridiculous 
16, uh, excuse me, 15.3% strikeout rate so far this season. Oh, that's because I included Jeremy Pena because he moved up the lineup. It was 16.2% for the top five hitters when I wrote the article before. That's what I was looking for. Top five hitters, 16.2% uh, strikeout rate so far this year, and the exact same 16.2% across all of last year for that group of hitters. Now that we're adding Pena in there, this year's number becomes 15.3 across the top six hitters. If we add him in from last year, it's 16.9%. Point being, not a good strikeout spot for Seth Lugo, who's an okay strikeout pitcher, but certainly not an aggressively good one. Um, just going to be a lot of contact, potentially a lot of premium contact. You've got Altuve just below the magic number for home runs. He's got three on the board already this year with a 271 ISO. Jordan Alvarez at 13.93. Kyle Tucker at 10.47. Four home runs, two home runs for those two players. A 306 ISO for Alvarez with a 208 WRC+. Plus. Just one of the best hitters overall in all of baseball. Love the three-man here if you can pay for it. They're affordable on DraftKings, too. Nobody over 5,700. FanDuel, you get uh, Alvarez at 43, but the others are a little bit cheap. You can average it down with Alex Bregman, which is a nice luxury to have him being the player that can average things down for you at 2,800 on FanDuel, 45 on DraftKings. Off to a slow start, still a lot of righty power in that bat. Jainer Diaz has been great to start the season. Two home runs, 302, 348, 465. Price is up a little bit compared to where it used to be, but still pretty cheap on both sides. Pena's out to a great start after a mediocre second year. Good first season, bad second season, 3,900, 2,900. He's still cheap for the start. Two homers, two steals, 333, 362, 489. 50% better than average creating runs so far. You guys know I like McCormick in the outfield if you need a cheaper guy uh, than one of these two. Jose Abreu, Jake Myers, kind of afterthoughts late in the lineup, especially Abreu these days. Negative 23 WRC plus isn't very good. No home runs, 0, 0. 0.088, 162.088. Um, Myers at least has two home runs and a 139 WRC plus decent ISO to start the season, but it's really a, a seven man strong group, but they're very, very strong in those seven guys. So you don't have to worry about rostering Arigetti, but I would target him with Royals bats. I like the Royals here. I wouldn't really go to Seth Lugo at the awkward pricing. If it was in the sevens, I think it would be more of a conversation and I would definitely stack Astros against Seth Lugo. Last game up, which is, uh, all right, 539. We're not go, not doing bad. 640 start time, don't forget. Uh, I think we got these lineups. We did. Hey, since we're here, um, actually, <laughs> that's funny. I, I said that as if I was making a transition to tell you guys something. I was actually going to say, uh, since we're here on Fantasy Labs, let me take this moment to tell anybody from Fantasy Labs who's not listening to this show but could be, it doesn't help anyone to insert these accent marks on these player names. All it does is fuck up my day. So don't do it. Thank you. This has been your uh, rant moment. Make sure there's no accents. I think Adelise has some. Yep. All of a sudden they started doing this. And I don't want to create yet another naming table in here. Nobody needs the accent marks. I think we're good. Yep. And since I started to do it, I will tell you guys that uh, since we're here, I'm sure you guys are looking for a place to build some lineups with a killer optimizer for a good price that also offers you sims for baseball, for basketball, whatever's left of that season, for football when that's back, for a bunch of other sports. Why don't you check out acemine.io? They've been our sim partner all through basketball season. You guys have been using their numbers without maybe even knowing it. We take a look at their site all the time, of course. They've got their tools up and running for baseball. They made that big announcement just the other day. It is definitely time for you guys to go check out acemind.io. A little subtle, subtle messaging down here. That's how you spell acemind, if you were wondering, and then it's .io at the end of it. If you go over there and you check them out, they offer three free days off the top, so you can use their tools for free for the next three days. And then if you like them, which I know you will, you'll want to sign up over there. Use promo code ROTOSCOUTS, all caps. Get you 20% off your first month. Helps us out a little bit. Tells them where you came from. They're also good guys. They're people that we know from, uh, if you've been around these uh, various communities that we've all been a part of over the years, you probably know who those guys are. Shockingly responsive customer support. Way less expensive, especially with these discounts in play, than some of the other sites out there doing sims. So check them out, Mind. Dot io one of these days maybe we'll have some other promos and stuff to read 
Try Diet Coke. I don't actually like Diet Coke. You guys diet diet soda drinkers out there? Are you guys soda drinkers at all? I'll still drink regular soda. I've never been a fan of, of diet. I don't like the whatever that chemical sweetness is in it. I know people love Diet Coke for whatever reason. So Cody Bradford, another popular play, is going up against the highly targetable athletics. We'll be going here all year uh, taking pictures against the athletics, even when we're not totally comfortable with them. He projects out okay given the matchup. He's only 8,600 on the FanDuel slate. I think he's definitely a better option than Seth Lugo in that price range. 9,000 is aggressively expensive for Cody Bradford on DraftKings, but I get it given the slate. Um, you can't make him like totally discounted over there. And then it's just going to be the most popular pairing with everybody else. Out to a decent start this year. He's only walked 2.3%, 22.7% strikeout rate, 2.13 ERA. A little bit bumpier in the XFIP. Um, hasn't really given up too much premium contact in the two starts. Last year, a little bit different story. 5.30 ERA, a 4.43 XFIP, 21.8% strikeouts. Those were still fairly consistent. Still a pretty good walk rate. Decent swinging strike rate. You know, not, not aggressively good, but not bad. A lot of premium contact, though. A fly ball pitcher giving up 11.8% barrel rate, 43.5% hard hits, nearly 91 miles an hour of exit velo. That's a recipe for home runs. 4.70% home run rate. There's some good, there's some bad with Cody Bradford. He's got pretty decent stuff. Measures out nicely this year so far on uh, on StatCast, but we're talking about a very small sample con compared to a you know small sample from last year, but a little bit bigger of one. We don't really need to talk about Ross Stripling going up against the Texas Rangers on the other side of this game. Um, but continuing with Bradford in the, I think I documented his starts. Yeah. So his first two starts, uh, five innings against the Cubbies, struck out six of 18 hitters, allowed a home run. So that premium contact crept up to bite him. Uh, two total earned runs on three total hits, though. Wasn't a bad start. Then he faced the Astros and was kind of surprising. He only struck out four, but he faced 26 hitters, gave up one run on two hits over seven and two thirds against that Astros team who are elite against lefties. We were stacking the Astros as a, you know, they might be sneaky today against the lefty. Uh, shows what I know. We were going to that team that day and we were disappointed. Uh, he had a good start. So maybe a little bit of faith. Again, this athletics team has been a bit of a spoiler in spots for these uh, for targeting them so far this year. A little bit of power. Shea Langoliers hit three of his four home runs last night to win the slate for some people at very low ownership. We mentioned him. I know I, I know I said his name. I know I pointed out his ridiculous contact profile, but I definitely was not endorsing him as a, hey, go play Shea Langoliers tonight. Somebody in chat did say it. Whoever you are, identify yourself because you deserve credit for that call. <laughs> I don't think anybody was expecting him to hit three home runs, but somebody in our chat yesterday said Shea Langoliers is going to hit a home run, like mark my words or something like that. So whoever you are, kudos. I didn't have him. I think uh, Eddie from over at Stochastic had him in a lineup to take down the uh, the big FanDuel tournament, though. But yeah, that was the killer combination. Langoliers with uh, Tyler Glass now, and then just have any of like Pete Alonzo, Ronnie Acuna, and a couple other guys last night. Uh, was, was the recipe for success. I do not expect Langoliers to come back and do that tonight, but he's on the board for a home run upside, 7.25 in the home run model. Did have the killer contact profile over the last few years. It's just, that's really what he does. When he's not hitting home runs, you don't get a ton of value from Langoliers, but he moves up the lineup into the cleanup spot. You gotta like that a little bit. Big run of right-handed hitters to start the lineup. Abraham Toro, not bad. He's a switch hitter. One home run on the board this year, just a 158 ISO and 95 WRC+. Plus, but medium-grade power, a little bit of speed for cheap pricing at third base. Zach Geloff gives you good power, good speed. 4,200, 3,300. He's reasonably priced at second base. J.D. Davis, premium contact galore for years now. Doesn't really translate into on-field like crazy upside. He hit 18 homers last year. He had 12 the year before and 365 plate appearances. Uh, brutalizes left-handed pitching on the right day. So I like the home run upside for J.D. Davis. 5.97 in the home run model. Maybe not getting as much credit as he should be. Two home runs on the year. They both came against a, a lefty in the same game. Tyler Nevin, not off to the best start. Over 10 plate appearances, 111 plate appearances. Wasn't all that good direct, right at the Mendoza line last year. Two home runs. Kind of an awkward fit in the five spot. J.J. Bladé, lefty, lefty, 3,500, 2,600. He's got a home run on the board. Uh, decent at getting on base. He's all right, but I would probably just focus on the four righties at the top of the lineup. 
Nick Allen, Lawrence Butler, and Darrell and I is kind of afterthoughts at the bottom of the lineup. If you choose to take a line against Cody Bradford here, I do think you have four capable enough guys to do it with there. It's just everybody who gets on board with the A stack as a contrarian play after they went off last night a little bit is probably going to those four hitters. So that's where you run into problems with it. You're just going to have the same group of guys and then everybody will make the same decision about starting pitcher and everybody will get to the same premium bats. So it'll be like A's, Yankees with, you know, the two top pitchers or whatever. It'll be very common builds. So if you do go there, at least keep that in mind. Maybe build somebody in at lower ownership, maybe go two way. Not saying that the A's are necessarily going to be popular, but if you do go that route, everybody will be on the same path. So try and set your foot on at least a slightly different path if you use those guys. Texas, I think you can fire away with against Stripling. 3.75 ERA, 3.61 XFIP, and an 18% strikeout rate over 12 innings and two starts last year. Just 18.4% strikeouts. The walk rate is good. The ERA was uh, bad at 5.36, but the XFIP was decent at 3.98. Too many runners on base, way too much premium contact to throw at this Texas Texas team. So I think you stack Rangers here. I don't think you consider Ross Stripling even at 6,000 on DraftKings. Very, very thin path to success. Evan Carter hitting third. That's kind of interesting. 4,300 for Carter, 3,000 on uh, the FanDuel slate. He's out to a slow start. He's got a homer. He's got a stolen base. Had a really good cup of coffee last year. High-end prospect for them. Came up, made 75 plate appearances, hit five homers, stole three bases. 339 ISO in the tiny sample, 180 WRC plus. Hits from the left side. Pretty good addition to the top of the lineup. I like him creeping up there. Um, Semyon Seeger, Evan Carter, Adolis Garcia, pretty solid four man for 5,100 apiece, 20,600 total on uh, DraftKings, 3,714.8 on FanDuel. And then you can average it down by including Josh H. Smith. On DraftKings, I'd probably just skip and take Jonah Heim for 3,600 as a better catcher. Or maybe you consider Jared Walsh for 38, or you even wrap around Leody Taveras at 34. I just really don't think that much of Josh, Josh Smith. He's out to an okay start over his 28 uh, backup plate appearances, but as I showed yesterday, this is who Josh Smith is. Sub Mendoza line both of these years in 200 and change plate appearances. Six homers that year, two homers this year. It's, it's not a good ball player. So I really don't like Josh Smith. I don't really understand why they're hitting him fifth. I guess just to get the lefty up there. But I would go Jared Walsh in that spot. It's a much better bat. So I would probably do the same DFS-wise. You do get uh, Smith at 2,200 and triple position eligible on FanDuel. So he's a little bit more flexible, a little bit more elig- um, interesting on the FanDuel slate. Walsh hits for power from the left side. Jonah Heim switch hitting catcher with a little bit of pop. Travis Jankowski, another semi-interesting lefty bat. Nine plate appearances so far this year. He's got a homer on board already in 287 last year. He only hit one homer, but he stole 19 bases. Pretty good triple slash. Very good on base skills. So you could even consider uh, you could consider Jankowski if you don't want to go Taveras from the uh, wraparound spot. 2,300 on DraftKings, 25 on FanDuel. That actually might be the move. You go there and then like that. That brings you to a $4,500 average for a stack that includes Semyon Seager and Adolis Garcia. It's not bad. 22.9 total for the five man. That's the path to averaging that down. Devin Scott saying uh, Gelliff and JD Davis would be my two batters versus Bradford. Probably going to use them in some lineups with no Bradford. I think that's a good call. You're talking about the uh, the best overall player on the team and a uh, very good right handed bat against lefties in particular, but one who just hits everything very hard. Again, JD Davis. Last year dipped to 9.5% barrels and 44% hard hits, which is still very, very good. Uh, And the year before that, 16.2% barrels, 55.6% hard hits. Coming into last year, I was saying all the guy ever needs is a full-time job and he'll hit 30 home runs. Uh, He fell short of that last year, but he had a decent season with 18. Hit for a decent amount of power. That was with San Francisco. We'll see if he can do better on the other side of the bay. So Texas, big yes. Cody Bradford, got to do it just because he's going up against Oakland, but uh, maybe a little life to the sneaky Oakland stacks up at the top of the lineup. I greatly prefer the Bradford side of it, but I could see failure there. He doesn't project out like he's not even he's not in the high 20s. He's not at a 30. We're just at 25.6 on FanDuel, 12 and a half on DraftKings for 9,800. It's it's you know, it's just the short slate like it's effective today. But if you had him at those prices on a lot of other slates, I'd be saying I think he's overpriced. 
So you could argue it either way. To sum up the slate, pitchers. Dylan Cease, big, big yes at the top of the board, but going up against a really good Chicago team. Hunter Green with some threats of weather in the area. we got to keep an eye on that, but I like the strikeout upside. Going up against a decent Milwaukee lineup, but got to gotta take somebody, right? And he's got, if not the best, the second best strikeout ceiling on the slate. It's him and Dylan Cease, neck and neck with that. Everybody else lacks strikeout upside. Stroman, no real strikeouts. Cutter Crawford is okay for strikeouts. Cody Bradford is okay for strikeouts. Wade Miley, no. Cole Irvin, no. Kyle Hendricks, no. Like this, this is not a strikeout oriented slate. So you got to consider one of these two guys on DraftKings. Um, I think in most of your lineups. Stroman, I have a lot of faith in him getting through five or six clean innings, decent innings anyway, maybe not totally clean. As long as he doesn't get beat by ground balls through the infield. I think we're dealing with an okay Stroman start. It's just he lacks strikeout upside for the high pricing. 10 1, 9,600. Maybe he picks up a couple, but not a killer option. I feel like he should be lower priced, but he's definitely, definitely on the board for shares. You got to use him. Cutter Crawford against Baltimore. Fairly priced. Definitely the best pitcher in this tier. I think he's a better pitcher than Cody Bradford, at least right now. Cody Bradford's got the much better matchup against Oakland. But Crawford's the better of these two pitchers for the cheaper pricing. Miley's a no, mostly. The As I said about Miley earlier, the thing that he might do, uh, this is for uh, whoever it was in chat that just got here and asked me to rewind the show or to start the show or basically doing that. Um, but yeah, Miley, the one thing I think maybe he has an effect on is like limiting Cincinnati's home runs somewhat, limiting their hard hits and home runs. I still like them to score a handful of runs against him and win the game against him and him not to really strike anybody out. Cole Irvin, I'm targeting with Boston Bats. I get it. I get that, it, you know, he's cheap and people want to go there, but I think people are weaving a narrative that might not really exist with Boston against lefties here. So really don't like it. Not in Fenway Park. Hendo, maybe you get a little life. You're, you're just hunting for clean innings out of Hendo at a very cheap price. If I'm going to the bargain bin, I do think he makes the most sense. As uncomfortable as that might be. Stripling, I don't believe in at all. Lugo, I don't believe in at all. That game's canceled, and Ryan Weathers is a total target for Yankees bats. Top stacks are up on the website, but uh, a good shortcut is typically you can just look at the run board. Yankees at 5-1-1 is premium. This game, the red one's already canceled, so you lose the Braves, but you got the Rangers at 5.17 implied runs. You've got uh, Boston and Baltimore, both at decent mid-four totals, and the Astros are in here somewhere at 4.94, but I also like the other side of that one at 4.6. So we've got some offenses to work with on this slate for sure. Reds officially announced a delay. That might be better. Um... If they start in a delay and they've got a clean window later on, that might be better because then we hopefully won't be dealing with the stop and start for Hunter Green. But just definitely keep an eye on it and could go could go haywire. Check what the professional weathermen say. Thanks for the note, Deb. Uh, top of the board, Aaron Judge, Juan Soto, Giancarlo Stanton off the top from the Yankees. Jordan Alvarez joining them. Petey Alonso is canceled. Fernando, T uh, not canceled, but his game is canceled. I'm sure he's a fine, upstanding young man. Fernando Tatis over the magic number for home run power. So is Corey Seager. We lose uh, Acuna and Olsen. Reese Hoskins over the magic number in Cincinnati for the Milwaukee side of that one going up against Hunter Green. Kyle Tucker over the over the line. William Contreras, kind of interesting that he's over the line. A little bit of ballpark in play there, but again, Hunter Green does give up premium contact when he's not striking guys out. Rizzo's over the line in a lefty-lefty. Adelise Garcia, love it. Marcus Semien, love it. Target that Texas team. Look at that. Texas and the Yanks. Sounds pretty premium as a high-end combo. You could also replace Texas with Houston. I think the Yankees are clearly the top of the board given the pitching matchup. Gunner coming in just under the line uh, for home run upside for Baltimore. You got Gunner, you got Sanfan there, right there. I'm sure Mount Castle's down here, yeah, 8.4. Some of them, uh, the Mets are, Mets are off the slate. Bobby Witt is on there from the Royal side. I'm sure Sal is not too far down. Yeah, Sal's right there. Then we get uh, Vinny. Vinny's still drawing a decent mark despite the cold start. As I said before, Nelson and uh, MJ probably could be a little bit higher. Definitely will shoot up the board as we update the model with, uh, with current season info. So I like that spot for the Royals. Royals are like my... Uh, I don't know how sneaky it is because I haven't looked at ownership, but kind of like the Royals, 
Red Sox at fairly low ownership, especially if people are going to that Cole Irvin play. I like those two spots in addition to those, you know, top just obvious premium stacks. With that in mind, guys, we're coming up on six o'clock. We've been talking about a six game slate for nearly an hour and 40 minutes. Still 35 people hanging out. Follow at Roto Scouts on Twitter. Hit the like button. Subscribe here if you want to get the notifications when the shows go live. Um, like and retweet it when you see it pop up. Check out acemind.io. Jump into the Discord, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Good luck out there, gang. If you're looking for NBA projections, I'm going to get right on that after we uh, get off of here and I update the couple extra lineups. And uh, somebody go win something. We'll be back tomorrow for more. See you.